welcome guys to the official pre-typing podcast where we basically talk about everything to do with pre-typing. And so in this season, you will learn about different aspects of the methodology, hear from different pre-typing practitioners and even see us try to make our own. All in the spirit of validating your idea with your own data. I'm Jonathan Sun and I'm Robert Scrub. This episode is sponsored by Exponentially. Supercharge your innovation process and get certified as a world-class pre-typer with the official Learn Pre-Typing online course. Sign up using the code OG100 for $100 off. Learn from Exponentially CEO and master pre-typer Leslie Berry and develop your own pre-type with personal feedback from Leslie. You will also gain access to the Exponentially app, an enterprise-level tool to help you keep track of your pre-types and join an exclusive Slack community of certified pre-typers. Sign up today at www.exponentially.com slash learn dash pre-typing comma and use the code OG100 for $100 off. Our next guest is Farzad Darouri. That's how you say your last name? Darourian? Darourian. Okay, I need to work on it. Farzad is currently the principal product manager at Zillow, where he works at the Data Engineering Core platform. Prior to this, he worked at Amazon in a variety of different roles with some pre-typing stories to boot. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing really well. Um, I appreciate you all having me on here. Uh, in this time where you don't get to see a lot of new folks or do any networking or talk about any new ideas, it's, it's great to have this opportunity. No worries, man. Um, I got to ask you about your dog. Tell us about tell us about your uh, tell us about your your one year old dog. Like, what species is he? Like, you know, kind of like what what does he enjoy doing? Oh, for sure. So, a little bit of background. Uh, neither my wife nor I have ever had a dog before. And about two years ago, I was at a local brewery, and there was just this big dog underneath our table, just sitting there chilling. I struck up a conversation with the owner, and she mentioned that uh, it was a Portuguese breed called an Estrela Mountain Dog old generation type dog, never been mixed with other breeds or anything. And about two years ago, I just got her a card and said, I would love that to be my first dog. Moved away, came back to Seattle. About a year ago, she said, hey, we have puppies. And I said, uh-oh, here we go. Um, so she's an Australian mountain dog. She's a large breed dog from Portugal. Uh, she's about a year old. Uh, she's a great family dog, super loud bark, scares all the squirrels and uh, Amazon delivery drivers and things like that away. But um, yeah, she's been fantastic to have, especially since I'm working from home. Yeah, they're kind of a Bernese mountain dog, aren't they? Are they of that that kind of mix? Yeah, they're they're in the livestock uh, flock guardian family. So Bernese mountain dog, somewhat a lot uh, like an Anatolian shepherd's in her kind of realm. Um, Pyrenees also in the realm. Leonberger, the German dog, looks very similar to my. Estrella, also in there. She, they're mostly sit and wait dogs, which is what I like. Very low energy levels, a lot of resting, only activates when she thinks there's a problem. So it's like the perfect dog for me. So do they have any hurting instincts or are they primarily just protection and um, protection um, and kind of like domain dogs, so to domain speak? Domain dogs, perimeter dogs, they like to scout an area and they alert. They do not have the same sort of like eliminate the threat type instinct, they're mostly alert dog. They can solve a problem if they absolutely have to, but they're more just designed to alert to a situation. And that usually handles it. Their, their bark is very, very intimidating, um, but they're not like very aggressive dog. They have no prey drive or anything like that. So it's temperament five fits your family perfectly. Fantastic. Yeah. Cool. I used to have a Rhodesian Ridgeback in the way that it would first alert anyone to something not being right in the house. It would do a like a, one of those high growl, low growl. So it sounds like yeah. an engine revving, and yeah. then the barks would come. So it's like yeah. first all of its hair would stand up on the back of its back of its spine, and then it would go and then get ready to basically fight. So that's a fantastic dog, by the way. We uh, had a play date with one when she was a puppy, and th th that dog was awesome. Yeah. And like I, in kind of contrast to you, to your dog, they're, they're tend to be energetic. They are rest dogs, but they, they need to exercise. They're just, yeah. that dog can't be going forever. Anyway, I digress, but that's cool. Sounds like you have a great dog. Yeah. I guess let's kick it off, man. So, um, how did you get into product management? Oh, 
So I didn't know what product management was. I didn't know that type of role existed. I'm originally from Massachusetts. Uh, my family uh, immigrated here. Uh, you know, my parents immigrated here just before I was born. My mom's Italian, my dad's Iranian. There was like three options for career paths, doctor, lawyer, or engineer. That was what they were focused on. Um, I had very little insight when I was going to uni and getting my internships into what a, what a product manager was. I thought it was just project management, scheduling, and organizing. It wasn't until I moved from the East Coast to Seattle um, and joined a um, health insurance company that I started to get a taste of what, what product management actually made uh, entailed. Uh, it suited me because it was idea focused, but it was also metric driven. You could have an idea, but you needed a result. Idea, result, idea, result. And that's the type of thing, that mindset that really kind of clicked with me. Um, shortly after I moved to Seattle again, I joined Amazon. Um, I joined Amazon as a data engineer, uh, invented my first product. And that's the conversation that we had on LinkedIn where uh, you saw my post regarding the gift marks. And that's where um, I really got my first corporate tense sense of product management. Uh, previously to that, I was in Guatemala. I did some product development work uh, in the agricultural field. Um, but my first corporate sense of product management was over at Amazon. Yeah. Mm. And speaking of it, that's a really, really good segue to the next uh, to the next question, which is probably the reason why I brought you on this podcast. Tell us about the Amazon digital gift card um, prototype. Absolutely. Uh, so it's also a physical product. Uh, this thing was really my career starter at Amazon and really uh, created a step change in kind of my career path and uh, my visibility and my ability to have impact and understanding sort of the prototype process. Um, before this, I had just seen, I think it was the PDF version. I tried to find the first introduction I had to prototyping. Um, I couldn't find the exact thing, but I'm sure it was a friend that sent me a link. And uh, when I joined Amazon, the recruiters were basically like, at Amazon, you can do anything you want. If you have an idea, you can go for it. And this was my first test of that concept. Are they telling me the truth? Can I have an idea as a data engineer and launch something? When I was on the team, I was supporting the gift card business. I loved Amazon gift cards, but I didn't like how quickly they, they vanished. You, I gave you a gift card. I give Robert a gift card. I give Jonathan a gift card. You receive it. You claim the code, you throw it away. It's gone. The sentiment attached to it is gone. The plastic is gone. Everything is gone. There's no use for it. So I had a, I was trying to think of a way to create sustainability in both memory, emotion, and the physical product itself. Um, I was also a data engineer though. So I knew when gift card spikes were happening, fall, kids going back to school, gift card spikes through the roof. Random holidays, Christmas, gift card spikes through the roof. How do you get what I'm trying to do, bring some re reusability sustainability into this, but also affect the business metric at, at Amazon's a metric have a company. That's how it started. I was trying to figure it out. And then one day I just thought, okay, spikes around the time college kids, uni kids, kindergartners buy books, gift card, gift card bookmark. That's what I want to do. You get no funding at Amazon unless you have a document or an idea that makes sense. Went to the, the coffee station, grabbed some napkins. Honestly, you folded one napkin and a half, wrote, this is a bookmark. Keep reading, love mom. The next one, the next napkin was just the book. Stuck the bookmark into the book as napkins. I proceeded just to go through, I think, eight or nine different Amazon buildings, stopping random people say, what do you think of this? Not even say anything, just showing it to them, letting them process it and then getting that immediate feedback and whether it was something they liked or enjoyed. Uh, I knew I had it when the first reaction after they got over the fact that a stranger was talking to them into an Amazon building, like there's not a culture of talking in hallways or like in elevators there at all. Uh, they smiled. So when they smiled, I was like, that's good. I'm, I get more smiles than this is stupid. So that's kind of how it started. You know, it's interesting because uh, now you're talking about like uh, gift cards. Like, I don't know why I never thought of this as a kid, but like 
I've always, but like now, now I'm a little bit older. I could have, in retrospective, I should have used like gift cards to profit to to like turn like all my kid birthday parties into profits. Right? <laughs> so imagine like if you have the cost of a birthday party, right? You get a venue and you get a cake, and then like maybe the cost to buy like goodie bags, and maybe that's a hundred dollars. And then you have to weigh out, okay, like, well, how many kids do I have to invite to get to, to say, for example, if each kid brings a 10 to $20 Amazon gift card. So if I invite five or six kids, then that means that I make a profit off my own birthday party. You, maybe some kid listening to this will say, you know what, there we go. That's my next, uh, that's my startup fund right there. Exactly. Like, and then you just start plan, and then you just start doing different parties. So birthday party, Christmas yeah. party. Easter party, you just keep going on and on and on. Yeah. I don't know why this came to my mind, but <laughs> anyway, so um, when did you first hear about prototyping? Um, it was a little bit before the gift mark process started. Uh, so it must have been 2015, 2016, something like that. Can't remember exactly, but a friend of a friend or I'll try to find the original link. Someone sent me a link to like just this this concept of prototyping. And I read an article, I don't even think I read the full PDF back then, but it's just something I instantly internalized. Um, prototyping does something that I think is very difficult to do in the corporate world, which is bring a, an idea into reality very, very quickly with limited cost or no cost at times as I showed with the, the gift mark. Um, so that's about when I heard about it. And it's just something that just made sense to me as a, as a, a, a new PM in, in, in the corporate world, right? It does a few things. It lets you action quickly. And it's also a communication protocol. You can use prototypes to speak across multiple disciplines easily. Engineers to CX designers, uh, um, human research specialists to product managers to senior folks across the organization. It's a very simple communication protocol as well. And speaking of which, I forgot to address this, the question earlier, but uh, so how are the digital bookmarks doing today in terms of popularity? They, I can't see the, the numbers anymore, obviously, since I'm not at Amazon, but they are available in five countries, 4.9 stars or above, except in France where they're at 4.8. Oh. I translate some of the comments. They're very picky about some of the stuff and they just want more options. So it's, that's great. Um, so they've done very well. Um, and it's a, and there, all the comments in the, in, in those, on all the product reviews are just kind of really inspiring. I go back once a quarter or every few months to kind of read through them. And like, when you release something like that and you see, you know, uh, I gave this to my, my grandkid, they're reading more, like all that kind of stuff. I get all teary eyed, but it's also, you know, motivates me like, okay, let's just keep trying new stuff to see what sticks. You can make an impact. Yeah, it's almost like it's also like almost like a perfect like kind of like bad day mood booster or like some days where you're not having like such a good day or like maybe you're not feeling as happy with your performance or something you can go back and like read those reviews and like, man, you know, I, 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 I can do this, right? Like, I, I'm a smart it. guy. Yeah, exactly. Like we can let's let's think of five things that we can kind of test out real quick and uh, get moving again. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, have you run any other prototypes other than the digital gift card? Yeah. So I use the process quite frequently and there are some that have gone directly to market through the prototype process. Um, I put a screenshot, I uh, shared a screenshot with you guys earlier in the doc, um, about a, a bag. So I'll talk about that in a, in a second, but I've used it as in physical products. I've used it uh, when developing features, working with customer experience teams. I've used it with machine learning scientists to build data sets. I've used it for both, where I may have an idea on, for example, at Amazon, I was in charge of um, search for consumables. I wanted to experiment with a feature that when you added, say, toilet paper in your search results, it would remove that item and then show you something else you may be interested in. So kind of like the, if you think about pulling stuff off the shelf, if everything you wanted at the store was just like right there, the shelf kept on changing and you're like, oh, that's what I needed next, blah, blah, blah. Kind of guessing with that. Um, and then also I've used it in conducting organizational meetings, overhauls. It's much easier to say, to use the prototype process where I just create a new org chart 
with new skills, new roles, and showing it to leadership and saying, hey, what do you think? Before you start writing a doc, before you start writing job descriptions, before you start doing anything, you get a quick sense of, is this the right it for the organization? So I've used it in a number of different ways. I use it all the time. Mm. What are your thoughts on it, Rob? Like, what do you what do you think about the whole digital gift card and like also some of the stuff that he's done? I think it's interesting, especially with the images that he provided in a recent post about a week ago about his journey with digit with those gift cards and how he kind of created them. They, it's interesting to see how the physical manifestation of an idea kind of works itself out through mm -hmm. the course of what he's done. What I'm interested in asking you, Farzad, in corresponds to what you're doing right now as a principal product manager, given your history with prototyping and experimentation. How did you find how did you have an outlet for that in your current position? That's a great question. And it's something that I've been working through on my own. So right now I'm very much in the back end. So I'm running a core data engineering team. Uh, our job is to create platform technologies that help scale Zillow Group's site features, move data quickly, efficiently, and accurately. Um, it's not a place where you might think prototyping might have a, a cause or like it might be not be the best place for the prototyping process. Um, and at first I did struggle to find ways to kind of implement it. Like, you know, I'm very much um, trying to quickly and efficiently get uh, engineering work live and have it scale. The ways that I found prototyping to be um, especially helpful to me is when I think a bit more broadly and I start focusing on customers, whether internal or, you know, our external end customers. For example, now that we have uh, scaled up our core infrastructure, it's time to start planning and creating roadmaps with our customer teams internally. For example, uh, our platform serves the search team. Uh, they have a roadmap, we have a roadmap, but traditionally and historically, our two teams kind of meet at uh, the OKR level and we meet once a quarter to do that. But with prototyping, I can look at their roadmap, look at our roadmap and find things that are like even only somewhat connected, sketch up an idea and go to their PM, their director, their uh, software development managers and say, I think this is how we can help each other. I think we can improve end-to-end -end latency if we do X, Y, and Z. And I can get a sense right away if that's in, that's something, an area where we can make progress and we should uh, spend our you know technology capital. Um, it's challenging, but it's super fun and interesting to solve those type of backend problems with the prototyping process. Most of the prototyping process that's been published has been about um, B2C, where it's mm -hmm. sales-based prototypes. In my experience, I find that there's more than that in terms of exploring features, mm -hmm. uh, modifying process. Have you experienced kind of the same thing in your current position or previously, where you've changed how prototyping is actually implemented or, or used in a certain context? Yeah, um, it plays along with what I was just hinting at, but just a bit more detail of that. My gift marks were definitely B2C, created something from Amazon, made by Amazon directly to customers. Um, but finding ways to integrate and scale in business teams is where prototyping, I've had probably the most success that will never see the light of day. Um, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a way uh, to approach this. Imagine you're in charge of an engineering team. You have a half dozen machine learning scientists, extremely valuable. You, you don't get their sprint time. You don't get their work time unless um, they're going to do something important. They're very hard headcount to get, to maintain, to retain. How do you engage a team like that if you don't really talk to them on a regular basis in the company? You come up with a quick idea that does not take a lot of uh, time and energy. Um, for example, if your company knows that a certain customer segment is something they want to target and where they think they can make change, prototyping gives you a quick way to come up with uh, new features that you can bring directly to those teams and say, hey, we don't usually talk. I have an idea. Play with this. Thing I made. It could be, um, you know, it can be just, uh, it could just be like a, a front end 
where you click something, it doesn't, nothing changes. It could be something where you get some feedback immediately. Um, it could just be an idea for a new data set. Uh, that type of stuff are conversation starters that have really, really helped me in my, uh, just in my career in general and helped, I think, uh, my teams make some big impact. In terms of those engagements, do you consider the skin in the game, the conversation that happens afterwards, or some sort of commitment to kind of move something forward in terms of where the idea can go? I think it, I think it's I think it's both because we all have skin in the game when you're talking about internal internal work. There's only so much time. There's only so much bandwidth, and teams need to prioritize where where they're investing their technology time. I'm speaking technology time only because that's just the industry that I work in. Um, and the prototyping process is focused on data. I like the position. The position it asks for when you hyper zoom into something is something that breaks down barriers. I can start a conversation with a team and say, hey, I, I wanna use 10% of your machine learning time. Here's the idea. I think we can make a 20% improvement in conversion if we do this. Be able to pro provide single sentences that are dense and precise and testable really gets you through a lot more doors. Uh, I found in, uh, in companies than coming up with like a grandiose doc plan, three-year plan, you can start small prototyping and you can build on, build upon that. And you're suggesting that you start with the outcome. You basically go like, if this, if this, I think that by scale, I can increase this, this particular feature uh, adoption rate by 30% with this. Yes. That, that would prompt somebody who says, oh, really? Tell me more. Exactly. <clears throat> and then a bit more detail kind of gets fed from there and people can judge and, and uh, consider it. Exactly. And you know what, this is, this might be slightly a tangent, but you know, the prototyping concept is not widely understood or used in the corporate world. And I've found that it is really, a, uh, it's an icebreaker, but it's a really gives like aha moments. It really breaks the norm. So if you're willing to use, and I, I talk about this in the doc a little bit, um, if you're willing to be embarrassed, which is a core concept of prototyping, you can get attention and you can get your projects or products or your ideas um, to be focused on. Uh, in meetings, I have no problem when we have senior leadership, SVPs, directors, TTOs, having a back and forth, especially on Zoom where it's, it's hard to get attention sometimes. You can write a doc, you can do this and this, but if I can hold up something and just to the camera, I'm like, hey, I think we can do this with a new data set. People look at it and they're like, oh, wait a minute, how would that work? I'm like, well, you do this, you click this, uh, we build this. Then they're like, tell me more. I mean, it is, it absolutely is a process where um, you can break the mold. And like, that's something I've been trying to communicate to my teams and the folks that I mentor is like, you know, you only have so much capital at work. Even companies that say we love failure, keep failing. They say that by, with guardrails, right? They want you on the trail. They don't want you to run off the cliff with like a million dollars. Prototype gives you those built-in guardrails. It's cheap. Um, you get instant feedback and you get your ideas to reality very, very quickly. So uh, it, it's something that just, um, you can use to your advantage. And it's especially interesting to me as it's always customer focused and data driven. Which leads me to my next question about metrics and the audit process that you mentioned before. Um, you, in, in kind of in your profile, you mentioned four products that you delivered in your first year. One was a tier one API, an Avro schema, streaming platform, core infrastructure. Mm -hmm. my, my curiosity is how did metrics kind of play into that conversation that would happen extended for something that the company may you know, vouch for, say like this, this sounds interesting, where can we go with things? How has metrics kind of played into your conversations about experiment, micro experimentation and, and how you do things? Metrics are absolutely my favorite thing. Absolutely my favorite thing. And I can't get into super detail with some of our internal systems, but I can give you kind of like a, um, some high level metrics uh, type things. You can be very general. You don't have to go too yeah. specific. It's just. If, if you think about a, a pipeline, a data pipeline, you just spent a long time working on it. Everything is moving faster, but it needs to be auditable and people are gonna have questions. Was it worth it? Here are some of the metrics that I find particularly interesting and how I show value. And there's 
there's the dog and uh, how I show value, but also um, how to find the next opportunity. For example, okay, so you have a pipeline. First metric, very common, end-to-end -end latency, right? How, how, how's the latency? We get data, how long does it take to end up on the site, right? Interesting, great for platform health, but what are the other uses? For example, what about a metric called time to text? Meaning at Zillow Group, you know, we get information, we, we send it out to folks. How long does it take in seconds or minutes to get a listing or some data and get it into the hands of a prospective customer or agent? That's the type of metric that gets the attention of uh, non-engineering folks in the organization. That's something you can be precise about. That's something you can drive value. That's something you can tie to other metrics. For example, uh, I created, I create decks. I'm from, my career was really kicked off at Amazon, which is a metric heavy company. I like building decks. I like being able to audit. For example, I can, you can look at a deck and say, hey, over time, the end-to-end -end matrix and time to text me metric uh, dropped down by 30%. We're now 30% faster sending uh, these messages. We've also noticed that we've increased conversion by a certain number. We believe it's because we got a head start over you know, our competitors. This is not real, we don't know, but those are the type of things you can start tying together when you have a, a robust set of metrics. Um, you can also do interesting things like we've increased the number of properties or data in our data lake. Uh, we noticed tangentially that our Zestimate pricing accuracy has improved significantly. We think there's a tie-in there. Let's double down in that area. Um, so I use metrics to explain, try to explain everything, to look for new areas of opportunity, to have conversation starters with other teams. Um, it's, it's, metrics are critically important. Um, I treat, and this is what I like about being a product manager, is it's kind of like you're your own GM, you're your own small business owner. Um, I use metrics in a way to make sure that I'm doing okay. I use metrics in a way to ensure the business is doing okay as a whole. And I use metrics uh, to find new opportunities. A lot of people will be listening to this podcast wondering how they can get started with prototyping or what's an effective way for them to start. Given your experience with the process along with other related processes in your line of work, what would be some like a, a top three recommendations or things that people should do to better understand this process so they could they could potentially implement it for themselves? For sure. First understand the process, read the PDF or read the book, read articles, find other sources and just get a sense. You need, to, I'm big into building a foundation of understanding before like setting off. It doesn't have to be a lot of time. You know, you can quickly get an understanding. First, build that foundation, understand it. Second, and this is the most important thing I mentioned before, uh, try to be embarrassed. Try to do something that you wouldn't normally do at work or like it, you can use it in prototyping your home life, whatever. Um, don't pick something comfortable. If you use it to break a boundary and you'll be in a much better place because once you get rid of that fear and you get out of that comfort zone, like you'll be able to think of wild ideas, wild metrics, all sorts of different things. So one, build the foundation. Two, pick something embarrassing. And three, just go for it. And by go for it, I mean, stick to the basic principles of prototyping. If you have an idea, get it created quickly in whatever, using whatever medium uh, you feel is appropriate and get it out there, test it and get your data points and then cycle through the process again. You can do that super quick. The final question I'll have for you, uh, Farzad, is, is related to this. It has to deal with patents and, and kind of protecting your IP, so to speak. Mm. Do people that are starting out with prototyping need to be concerned that people will take what they've done or that they're experimenting with and hijack it or recreate it in some fashion? Or do you feel that the prototyping process allows you to basically micro experiment to the point where that concern isn't really, it, it isn't as extreme as it, as it might seem to be? So I'm not super familiar with IP law or anything like that. So this isn't like advice or you know, professional anything, right? But my experience with it is 
my prototyping napkins are now in the, the US patent services books. My stupid napkins are photographed and part of my original patents. So it gives you lineage. Like it's absolutely ridiculous. I have, was with the vice president uh, uh, of legal at Amazon in the meeting and he was like, oh, uh, do you have like, you know, we need to get history of your product idea and all this for the patent thing. And I'm like, well, I have this napkin. They're like, perfect. That's great. Let's take a photo of that and put that in the packet. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This is ridiculous. But of course you have to be concerned, but prototyping is great because you, you build up that history of your product. It goes to market quickly before maybe other folks are able to do so. So I think it gives you a jump start. Um, of course you should you know, contact professionals if, you, if something is working and go through all the, form, the forms and like regulations and be smart about it. But I think this gives you a head start. I imagine at the patent office, there's an entire category called stupid napkins, oh, where it literally I, I, is just- Absolutely. <laughs> just an entire library of written down scribbles on pieces of paper, yet they speak to some product that currently has a patent of some type. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, the process of going to market with uh, that from end to end is, uh, was super fun. I mean, a lot of good memories there. Do professionals need a certain set of skills or talents to be able to prototype properly? No. And that's also the fantastic thing. Just to speak on the gift mark thing a little bit more, you've seen the images. I have no design talent. I have no ability to create anything in Photoshop, in PowerPoint. I have no design ability. My only failing grade growing up, my mom still reminds me, was cutting. I was unable to cut paper in a straight line up through first grade. Like, but with prototype, it doesn't matter, right? You just get the idea live. And the worse it looks, the more, and you get it, like the right it with it, and you get more positive feedback, the better the idea is. Like the le less polished it is, less polished, great feedback, it is definitely much closer to the right it. Um, and that's what I was speaking to a little bit earlier. It's like a great way to break down barriers. So the bag that I mentioned earlier um, and that you guys mentioned earlier about like prototyping successes, I only hinted at it. I was at Amazon. I was in charge of PC gaming for marketing in North America. We had an Apex West event coming up. We're spending a lot of money on internal advertising and banners and stuff, but I wanted something that would extend the range of our marketing effort. So I wanted to create a product that was useful to customers that they would take away and kind of spread like the marketing uh, impact. I created a, a bag with a shopping cart. You can see the images in the dock. The like copy and pasted, like printed out stuff, put this little handbag together. Uh, I went to a designer I know really well. He's now my brother-in-law, Johnny. And I said, Johnny, I wanna make something useful for customers. Here's what I came up with. He said, that's terrible, but I know what you're trying to do. I, I know where you're getting at now. Like if I had written a doc or if I had just kind of sketched something out like, I don't know if we would have broke that barrier between, you know, designer and product manager that with a data engineering background, right? It's too big of a gap, but creating a prototype bag, a paper bag and showing it to him triggered something in him. And we created what you can see in the doc, which is that PAX West backpack. And that thing was everywhere. It was a hit. It was selling on Reddit for 10 bucks. Like it was, it was crazy. Um, so forget exactly what we're talking about, but, um, Prototype just lets you break down barriers just, and requires, oh yeah, it requires no innate skill in any area to start. So if I heard you correctly, it sounds like the more rough it is, the more it, it lends itself to interpretation by other people who are seeing it. Whereas sometimes I've been arguing that the believability of your prototype is a factor in determining how people would engage it. But it sounds like you you actually have more advantages if you keep it somewhat Spartan, so that mm. people can frame it in their their mental model of how it might go. Is that is that accurate? It's it's accurate. The only point I want to drill down on are is the word believability. You can have something rough, and it, as long as it has like five percent of believability, just enough to trigger something in uh, you know your um, your viewer's mind that they think it could be real, then you're, you have enough believability in my mind. You have enough. As soon as they think it could be real, 
that triggers something into them saying, okay, now how do I engage with something that is real? This isn't just a talk. This isn't, um, you know, ballroom chatter now. Like this is something real, like what would I do with it? So you just need a little believability. I wouldn't uh, like hyper-focus on it um, at first. But enough to kind of make sure that people understand exactly. what you're putting in front of them. They get exactly. the, the, the writing concept and where it can go. And then they can reinterpret based on their own intuition and their, their own judgment. Yeah, and that reinterpretation is also very exciting for folks in product. I mean, they might do something with it that you, well, I'm sure this happens every day, millions of times a day, where you create something and someone uses it in some kind of, not the way you expected. That's a new product or, or, or idea or a feature you can build into the next version. We've been looking for people in this space, innovation, product, prototyping, that are doing really interesting things online, maybe publishing their works, or maybe even getting a clubhouse or having a Slack channel. Um, what are some recommendations you would have for us in terms of us checking out what other people are doing in this space? You know, this is my first stint at reaching out to the prototyping community. So I thank you for Jonathan for reaching out. I don't have specific things or uh, places that I can tell you to go. Um, for other folks. Um, for me personally, uh, I'm really enjoying this conversation and would just like to join a, a community that maybe you guys are starting or that's already out there. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of work from home right now. <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity for prototyping folks or folks doing prototypes to get really quick feedback. Um, and there's a gap there. So, if you guys come across anything or you develop anything, please let me know. Happy to be involved. I'll send you an invite, Farzad. There's something on LinkedIn right now called Prototyping Professionals. And mm -hmm. I know that there's a couple of other Slack channels that me and Jonathan are circling around. So yeah, we can do those offline and send those to you. Okay, fantastic. Jonathan, if you may. I, I, I want to say, I, I want to ask if you could still buy that backpack because that backpack looks dope. Like, I wish <laughs> no. I had that. I wish I had that in high school. Like, I would be the biggest, uh, coolest kid and coolest kid around. I only know of, I only have two left. I have one that uh, I keep and I, uh, my, my brother-in-law, Johnny, he has, he has another one, but I gave him the small one that, you know, was used as the model. I kept the, the full size. Okay. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll read your blueprints. Uh, I won't sell them. I won't steal your, your, your patent like that, but I'll read your blueprints. I have a lot of Amazon boxes laying around at home. So I'll, oh, I'll, 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 I'll tape something together like that, you know, carry, uh, carry it around and, you know, show, showcase my loyalty to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> right on. Um, I'd love to uh, slightly segue the conversation to um, having Pat Copeland as your skip. Um, yeah. I'm curious to know, like, what that experience was like for you and like what stood out about his managerial style? Oh, um, definitely. So um, common knowledge, Amazon has a lot of rotation of employees. They encourage movement within the company. You frequently have manager skip changes, whatever. So I have had a lot of experience with various levels of folks at Amazon. When I joined uh, my then boss, Joe Mays team, my, her boss was Patrick Copeland. I still remember our, our first meeting, you're meeting the new VP, like you're, you wanna come in buttoned up, you have a doc, you have something to talk about. You don't just, just, just do random meetings. And he was just immediately had this air about him where you just felt comfortable. Like you, you could tell right away he was experienced, but you could also tell right away that he cared. He, he was, uh, a VP that I knew I could go to with an idea. I knew I could be a little bit more risque in my docs and like presenting something. You know, a lot of companies say, oh, you know, think wild, think, you know, just think big and just come up with something. They don't mean that. They don't want you to do anything too crazy. With, uh, with Pat, absolutely. I had no problems burying something in a doc that was a little bit crazy. And he would always just call it on be like, that's this kind of thing we need to do more of. Um, so he, he was a, he was a great skip. I really enjoyed uh, learning from him and, uh, and working with him. I'm glad. Uh, and uh, spoiler alert, uh, you're going to see him in uh, episode nine. So. Uh, oh, right on. Yeah, oh, he, he, he's great. Yeah. He's got, he's got a bunch of prototyping stories on his own uh, recommended uh, by Alberto. So uh, 
yeah you'll uh you'll you'll get a you'll you'll have a chance to next time y'all to uh y'all y'all to connect uh y'all can talk about the experience on being on uh, robin john's really podcast um what's um what are some prototypes that you're trying out in your own life currently and what do you hope to do in the future with prototyping so i saw as i was thinking about like this sort of question um i've always wanted to write a book right um i've been fortunate enough to have a lot of life experience traveled a lot i've lived in a lot of different areas and now i'm fortunate enough to have uh nephews two boys my sister has two boys and like since i can't be there like very often i'm i'm in seattle they're in massachusetts um covid is happening like the travel restrictions is difficult um i i feel like i have a lot of learnings that i could I want to be able to communicate to them, right? So I've been using Prototype in the book writing process uh, for myself. Um, it's not about like specifically product management or business or anything. It's just like life lessons, right? Um, I've never written a book. You know, I've written docs and like papers for uni. So I've been using it to come up with um, similar to the way Alberto did with his, his book, actually. I've been trying to follow that model of creating the first Prototype of my book uh, seeing if other people are interested in it, but also using that prototype as self-reflection for myself. Am I, is this what, I, what I'm really trying to do and trying to get the right it from myself? So that's how I'm using it right now, like at the very, very early stages. Um, if I, you see my desk, it's covered with yellow post-it notes that are chapters and like cover art, but I can't draw like all sorts of stuff. So that's what I'm using in my personal life right now. It's funny because uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, um, I, 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 I prototyped a, uh, a, pre uh, a kid's book on prototyping. Oh, uh, I don't know if Rob got a chance to see it or not, but uh, basically I had, this, uh, I had this cover for a book called Bark Light. And so basically the idea was um, the, the, like Alberto talks a lot about beer for dogs and I thought it would be a really, really good like kid's book for like prototyping. So, <laughs> choose, and then I, I like got... It. I got my ad banned from Facebook ads because I had a bottle of beer <laughs> on the front <laughs> cover. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wrote the first chapter of Bark Light. It was basically the, I, it was basically like two dogs like needed, wanted, wanted money to buy like themselves like a doggy car. And so, uh, <laughs> and so they, they were like, um, and so they, they worked menial jobs until they got, until they injured themselves doing menial jobs. And so they were like, let's start a business. And then that's when they read the book, prototype it. <laughs> I, um, hey, it, when you're done, or if you got a prototype, I can show my nephews. I'll get you some feedback. The, the 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 tough part about it though is like I ran a prototype on it, so I made a landing page for Bark Light, and um and I did a and I spent about twenty dollars on Facebook ads, and I got zero email signups. <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't a good prototype at all. I, I, it's resonating with me. I think you might have it. Maybe a few more uh, refactorings of it, and you'll get it. Maybe. So, uh, so Rob, in case you were wondering what my prototype for the month was, I probably should write an, uh, and, uh, write about it later, but yeah, this was, that was my prototype for this month. Okay. Yeah. But so yeah, as far as I, in case you're, you don't know, um, we, I issued a prototyping challenge to basically do one prototype per month, no matter what it was, um, okay. just to see what the reaction would be and to do something that would be intrinsically motivating or, or beneficial for your business. If you have a small one, Okay. Um, I've done a couple so far, and it sounds like Jonathan, you've done one for kids' books. Uh, speaking of which, oh, I'd be, I'd be, um, since you were a, you're an ex Amazon person, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but they just came out with Build It, which is something that that uh, a Amazon just promoted, where they present their favorite concepts. They they tell uh, basically their audience tells them which ones do you want to see. They want to see pre built ordering by pre by pre ordering them. So they pre-order their Amazon's particular ideas. And if a certain concept that Amazon has reaches its pre-order goal in 30 days, they'll begin to build it. So it's like their own personal Kickstarter program, yeah. but they're doing it with three, diff three different concepts and they put it in their blog recently. And when I saw that before we did our, our, uh, our podcast just now, where we started, I thought, all right, I got to ask them about this. Have you seen that, that article? Because I think it just came out, what's today, the 22nd? I think it came out last week. I have not seen the article. I saw the headline today. It popped up in my uh, LinkedIn feed, um, but I haven't. I didn't click on it or look into it. My immediate thought was, somebody is very clever at Amazon to come up with 
this model. And they're very scrappy to be able to get that sort of idea through to live. So whoever did that, kudos to them. And I'm sure they had some sort of prototype small version of this concept before it got any traction. Absolutely. And we, we were speculating that if other businesses are watching closely on what they're doing, who's to say like Kohl's or Target or someone else has this side section that basically is like their own personal Kickstarter, but it's the ideas and concepts that they want to sub-brand as their own that correspond to the, the target audience that they serve. And they know a lot about because of the metrics, because of the, the customer service interactions. They yeah. have a lot of data that they can just leverage for that. So it's an interesting experiment they're doing that kind of reflects on other things that we've seen. But I'm, I'm really interested to see where it all goes. Yeah. And as, when, as we discussed metrics before, I think that sort of idea, I think, adds trust back into the process because you're not harvesting information from your customers in a way that they don't understand. You're getting direct feedback from customers. Like you don't have to worry about clips or tracking or cookies or anything. Customers are literally telling you that is what I want. And I think that's a fantastic idea. I'm, I'm curious to see how it will play out. So Jonathan, I think we're at time. Is there anything else we'd like to wrap up with Farzad? Maybe uh, get into some of the th places that people can find them online. I think, well, it's interesting when you were mentioning kind of like, you know, the, the, the sections at like Kohl's and stuff like that. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is like, hey, do you guys remember the as seen on TV kind of commercials? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think those are like some of the, the, the silliest, I, I, uh, th those are some of the silliest products or prototypes that I've ever seen. Like kind of like the, um, what are some that stick out to mind? The one where you can like crack an egg on a crack an egg on a guy's like really long nose, crack an egg on Pinocchio. <laughs> Or, um, or like kind of like those things are like those, those little like sleeping bags that like try to massage you while you're like sleeping, but like it really doesn't work. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how they validate their stuff. Like I really need to know how as seen on TV validates everything that they do and like whether or not their stuff actually sells or not, but it's hilarious. I'm not sure either, but you know, that as seen on TV might be a funny way for someone who's doing the, the prototype monthly ch challenge to communicate yeah. an idea. Like that QVC. would be funny. Is QVC still around? I think so. Okay. Yeah, they have okay. to be. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Okay. So Farzad, where can we find you online beyond uh, connecting with you on LinkedIn? Are you, do you have anything out there that you're kind of uh, putting your thoughts towards anything you're doing in social media? Um, not at the moment. Honestly, it'd be great to, to talk to more folks on LinkedIn. Happy to join the Slack channels always open to communicate with anybody about any, any ideas or, you know, share my advice or, or learn from others. So if you, you are interested in con connecting with me, just do so on LinkedIn. Um, and then as I go through the book writing process, this may or may not ever happen, but I'll be sharing updates on LinkedIn. Could be a prototype where you actually use a morsel to say, say like here, I'm, I'm thinking speculating about writing a book. Here's a sample from one of the chapters that I've been writing. Then that way, if you get some response and be like, okay, well, if you're, you can do the pre-order idea that Amazon's doing and say, if we want to pre-order the book and just see where that goes. I think my go-to-market strategy is done. That's fantastic. <laughs> I could literally do that <laughs> in the next six hours and see what happens. Yeah, yeah you could do it. All right. Uh, Jonathan, anything, any last words you'd like to leave with Farzad? Um, not much else. Um, Farzad, thank you for uh, attending our podcast. We really appreciate uh, the conversation that we had with you. Um, and uh, remember, audience, uh, fail Ferrari fast, McDonald's cheap.